thank you for your patience. We're ready to start now. I'd like to introduce to you your speaker this evening. His name is Michael Murphy. He is the director, I believe, of the film What, on the, what in the World Are They Spraying? And he's here to talk, you, talk to you about geoengineering. Let's give him a fine welcome, please. And that was a correct introduction. Thank you very much. And thank you to the Conscious Life es Expo and everyone here that uh, has concerns about the, uh, the G issue of geoengineering, which we had the opportunity to, to bring this issue out to literally millions of people with, uh, with our two initial films, What in the World Are They Spraying? Why in the World Are They Spraying? And uh, today it's actually somewhat common knowledge when we started back in... 2008, 2009, it was very rare to really uh, to meet anybody other than uh, a select few people who were aware of this. How many people in the room today are aware uh, of this issue and have pretty advanced knowledge? I would think most of the people in the room. And uh, so it's really everybody in the room. We have a couple of people and uh, we were actually where you were not, not too long ago. Today we're going to talk... Um, uh, we're going to, I guess, go to the second level of geoengineering and and uh, what we're doing after we released the first two films, a worldwide movement uh, was started, um, largely attributed to our work collectively with activists around the world, um, handing out DVDs and wearing T-shirts, which we have. And come and see me if you're interested in, in one of uh, my first two films. We encourage everybody to make copies and hand it out for free. And that's one of the ways that we were able to get this issue uh, out to the masses. And uh, this, at times, can, can be an overwhelming issue sometimes. And to those of us who have been uh, at the forefront of bringing this information, it can be very grim sometimes, especially when you go out, when you talk to family members who might be in denial about this, or other people who are aware of it but feel like they're powerless in terms of what we can do. Well, right now, looking at our geopolitical uh, arena, we've entered into, I would say, a season where we have a lot of interest in terms of stopping geoengineering because for the first time we have an issue that has emerged that we're all aware of, uh, the global warming or the climate change agenda. And it's intimately related to the issue of, of geoengineering. And before I start the trailer that we've been working on in the film that we're working on, which is titled Unconventional Gray, I uh, want to get really into uh, the revelation that I had and what had been my process of understanding in terms of where we are and really what we need to do. And again, after having films which did wake up millions of people, and today as I go out into the public and I talk to people about this issue, most people now have at least heard of it. So we've come a very, very long way in a very short time. And I struggled with making another film. And I don't feel like the world needs another film. And there's been this push to simply wake more people up. And maybe we can stop this at waking more people up. Waking people up is not going to end this only. Although it's critical. And those of us who are working towards that, I want to encourage you to continue doing that. But if we're only waking people up, the establishment, is not, uh, the establishment who's behind this, they're not threatened by, uh, by people being aware. And there's not a magic number that we can hit. Let's say, uh, you know, 21 million people, all of a sudden our skies will clear up. <laughs> there has to be rubber uh, where, uh, where the rubber meets the road. And I feel like we're forced into this, uh, into this area with this issue. And uh, I'll, I'll tell you, geoengineering programs are designed to change the temperature of our planet. And they're designed to manipulate our weather. And we did a very effective, uh, I think, uh, approach in why in the world are they spraying. However, uh, because they're not included in climate models that source CO2 for the changes that we're seeing, it makes climate models flawed at best, fraudulent by those who are in the wear. Um, 
and by those who are in the know, know. And we don't debate the global warming issue. It has no benefit to what we're trying to do if we support it. It actually supports the very legislation which is aimed right now, which I'll get into in a minute, towards legalizing geoengineering programs. But because these programs have been ongoing, they're designed again to change our temperature and to manipulate our weather. It's impossible to determine whether the planet's warming or cooling. And I like to compare geoengineering to a heater. So let's say if you're in your home and you turn the heater on up to 9,500 degrees, would it be safe to make the assumption and say, oh my God, it's getting hot outside? It could be getting hot outside, could be getting cold outside. You don't know until you t turn the heater off or stop geoengineering and you allow the home or the region that you're in to calibrate back to what the normal temperature would be. And that's where we're at with geoengineering. So I had the revelation in terms of what we have to do. We have uh, climate agreements and just COP21, the Paris Climate Agreement, I was in France over the summer filming for this. These climate agreements uh, are aimed at consolidating, consolidating the largest amount of both monetary and political power into the hands of a few at the exception of literally everything. It's, uh, the initial five years is expected to be over a $15 trillion agenda. That money has to come from someone. After the, uh, the quick video, we'll talk about some of the plans for the climate change agenda and what we've uncovered and what they're researching, but how it's intimately uh, uh, related to geoengineering. Geoengineering is changing, without question, the, uh, our climate. And because, again, it's, and I'm going to continue pressing this, because it's not included in climate models, it makes climate models flawed and fraudulent. And because of that, you cannot move forward with taxation. You cannot move forward with the climate change agenda. So we have very, uh, we have goals and objectives with my next film. It's a call to action film. And really, the reason I'm doing it is to gain support for a lawsuit. And our lawsuit is... Uh, towards any climate change initiatives, whether it be taxes, whether it be legalizing geoengineering, anything. And what we're doing, we're demanding that all climate change talks, all mandates, and all laws are rescinded immediately until we test zero negative, until we're not testing for geoengineering programs at all. And why that's an effective and a beneficial approach to go there are large interests, actually on both sides of the climate change agenda. So certain people stand to make trillions of dollars with various climate change initiatives. And if we get court injunctions stopping those mandates, that will gain their support, or it should gain their support to stop geoengineering so that we can move forward. Uh, and also there are many people on our side, uh, about, a, uh, about a 62, I believe, percent of the population believes that the global warming issue or the climate change agenda is a deliberate fraud. Again, I don't enter into that dialogue. I don't think that we need to. I think what we need to do is gain support from both sides in order to uh, move forward with our objective, and that's gaining uh, clean air clean food, and really a world without geoengineering. And I think that we will see the changes in our climate quickly, dramatically go away, and then we'll be able to live as God had created us to. So I think for the first time, we have an incredible opportunity to move forward. So I hope that uh, we're speaking a message of hope today. Uh, do you guys want to see the, the trailer um, that we put together? This is the second uh, film trailer, and we're currently working on this project, which should be complete. Please pray for us. In, uh, in the spring, hopefully in May, if we move quickly. So here it is. Thank you. engineering technologies have been developed for many decades and they've been used already for geopolitical leverage. We are definitely getting climate change from the geoengineering program. There's no doubt whatsoever. 
geoengineering is deliberate climate change. It's making the experiment that we've been doing accidentally since the Industrial Revolution intentional. When you fluctuate a jet stream, you have warming in certain regions, cooling in other regions. There's no possible way with our ongoing geoengineering programs that an accurate temperature reading can be made around the world. possible to uh, maintain the sovereignty of nations and what are the risks in terms of forming what some critics are calling a, a carbon dictatorship. How would a democracy stand in the way of instituting like a global climate policy? That's an interesting question. We're not going to improve life with more government controls telling you what you can and cannot do in your personal lives and in your businesses. Climate change is the threat that allows for the implementation of United Nations Agenda 21 Sustainable Development because it creates an external threat that causes the need for a total transformation worldwide. When these computer models are predicted, are these programs included in these models? To be honest, I, 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 don't think, I don't think that they are included, but um, I'm myself not, not from the services. They're looking to implement based on this theory of climate change and CO2 being the cause. No question about it, geoengineering programs, which are ongoing, are the cause of most, if not all, the changes that we're seeing. And any climate model that is not including the ongoing geoengineering programs without question is flawed at best, fraudulent, at the very worst. We need people who are aware, but then knowledge isn't enough because we need action. Thank you. That's very much of a summary of what we're doing. There's a lot more to the story. Um, I'll tell you about our aerosol collection project that we're working on. Then I, I was hoping that this panel or this breakout could be more of a question and answer. Uh, sometimes I think we want to talk about all that we know, but uh, if you have questions, I think that's the, the most effective way really to talk about the issues that are most important to us. Uh, in, in the public. So one of, uh, one of the things that we're doing, or we're hoping to do right now, we're researching this, working on getting an airplane. We have a, a crew. Uh, we have collection sample device uh, going up into the trails, and that has never been done before. So after we released What in the World Are They Spraying, hundreds of people, I would say about hundreds of people around the world started uh, taking rain, rain tests. And what they're finding, they're finding this geoengineering footprint of aluminum, barium, strontium, other things as well um, that we're uncovering. Looks like they're spraying coal fly ash, which is very, very toxic. Um, it's regulated to be collected on precipitators, so it's not, <laughs> it doesn't go up into our air. There's strong evidence now that that is another thing that's very effective for various goals and objectives in geoengineering programs, but it appears that that's being sprayed at least in some of the geoengineering programs in different regions. So that's a big concern of ours. So we're going to go up, uh, we're going to test the trails, and really take away the plausible deniability from those in our scientific community who are telling us that these are simply condensation trails. Uh, and also, there's one thing that I live or did live for a while part-time in Maui, and we didn't see too many trails, but we did see the wispy-type clouds that the trails turn into. So we're very aware of what artificial clouds are, but we didn't have the airplanes. 
what we started noticing on satellite were these anomalies um, that would originate from a source point and come over Maui. So we'd see these big artificial clouds. And a friend of mine, Bruce Douglas of Maui Skywatch, he would contact me and he would say, hey, 115, 130, you're going you're gonna to get some artificial clouds. And I didn't believe him at first, but he effectively and accu accurately uh, predicted these. So I went over there and I started watching with him. Sure enough, it appears that these are uh, uh, sea-based, ship-based cloud generators. Um, and we're seeing most of the aerosols, at least in the Pacific, start from a source point. Uh, the the uh, satellite that we're using has reflectivity. So if a cloud is more reflective, thus has aluminum, other particles, it will be red and green. Um, and so we found a way to effectively predict when we see the artificial clouds. Uh, it's going to be very critical that we move forward with the aerosol collection project looking at these anomalies, going up, getting photographic evidence, and then going into the cloud and getting a sample if we can. So pray for us right now. We're in the process. Hopefully we can look back at the video uh, in a year or two saying, well, we got it done. Because there are, there are a number. It seems like it's something that would be very simple and very easy, but there are a lot of variables in terms of pressurization, FAA clearance to get up into the sky. Um, in terms of having the right aircraft and having a pilot that's willing to go out that far over the open ocean. So we have a lot of uh, variables, a lot of things that have to come into alignment. I'm very confident um, that they will. So that's something that we uh, feel is going to be critical in terms of moving forward and stopping these programs. But I can't stress where we're at. Uh, again, COP21, the Paris Climate Agreement, was signed. And it's a partially legally binding agreement. And it will, and it has. It's created the framework to legalize geoengineering without our input and without the input of the legislators. Many people are now arguing that it requires Senate to pass. 95% uh, of all uh, international agreements have been signed via executive order by the president. So it doesn't have to go through, necessarily go through the Senate or go through Congress. And we also now have the TPP and the TPIP, which is a legal backdoor that it appears that they can use. We know the agenda is to create global governance, which will circumvent constitution, state laws around the world. That's their agenda. And this is world government agenda. So uh, they're not, I don't think, too concerned about Senate and the rule of law. They're going to use uh, this as what the Obama administration had called the climate change issue, a national security issue. So that tells me it's leaning towards ex executive order. And it's going to leave us, I think, a very short window in terms of how and when we can address this. And Obama, the Obama administration, just announced that the United Nations police force would be coming to America. How many people think they're coming to protect our constitutional rights? No, they're not. They're coming to enforce UN laws. This is world government. That's what the agenda is. Uh, the reason I say that, there's been various, uh, I guess it, uh, you, would, you would call them attacks on the words that I speak. Um, people saying they're not, they have to go through the Congress, they have to go through the Senate. Even people in the movement that have said, don't worry. They're not going to legalize geoengineering. They're not talking about legalizing geoengineering. In these climate agreements, no, they haven't spoken about legalizing geoengineering. What they're saying, because there was not a legal carbon reduction strategy, we will have to geoengineer. And today we can take both legal and legislative steps in addressing this. Once it's legalized and it gets out of the jurisdiction of the United States, it's going to be exponentially more challenging to address. So I think we have a golden opportunity. I think we have an incredible opportunity. Yes, our back is against the wall. Yes, they're spraying us. Uh, but again, I want to be very clear uh, about this. And I almost feel like I'm on a political campaign. And, and what I'm doing, uh, am I selling a strategy? You better believe I am. You better believe I am because I'm confident this is the only strategy that's going to work. So I'm pleading out to the community, to those who might be seeing this on the Internet. I'm pleading out to each and every one of us. Take your activism, take your knowledge, take this issue into a next step. One of the areas, and then hopefully we'll go into 
Q&A. I didn't prepare for this, <laughs> but I've learned so much in the process of this film. The climate change agenda, uh, again, it's, it's a $15 trillion agenda. How many people know that this agenda is already taking place in California? We have a carbon tax here in California. How many people are aware of smart meters? And good for you. Okay, well, we have to hold our ground and make sure that these executive orders are not passed so that you have a choice between uh, for this. What the plan is this. Today we have smart meters can monitor everything in your home, what appliances you use, when you use it, um, specifically when you're home. Cap and trade. Cap and trade is a cap of our carbon usage. And there are various states now who are signing on, and we feel like this is going to be the United Nations climate change agenda. That's why the film's name is un un conventional shade of gray or unconventional gray. It's a very unconventional way of looking at the climate change issue. Nobody's looking at geoengineering, but it is the key to stopping this. And we are entering into a time where you will have to be reduce your carbon usage. We all utilize carbon through our energy uses, through the amount of miles that we use. Oregon, now they have a mileage tax. Yeah, well, that could be something. Um, but every energy source now that we use is carbon-based. So we will all have to have a cap on that. And these smart meters, the goals and plans are to reduce our carbon intake. So you might, let's say, utilize 100 units of carbon. You're going to have to cut that down to either 60 or 40. And if you go above that, you might pay twice or three times the amount. You may live 20 miles or 30 miles away from work, so it's 60 miles a day that you might have to, that you might drive. You might have to reduce that by half, so if you go over that mileage, you will be taxed. These are reduction efforts. Um, you might use a vacuum cleaner that you bought two years ago in your home, and if it is not deemed or dictated by this corporate dictatorship, it's a carbon dictatorship, you might get fined. Fifty, hundred dollars, five hundred dollars for not using a green uh, compliant appliance. This is corporate dictatorship mandates in your home on steroids. Corporation, corporations love this. They will love forcing you to use their products and appliances. And again, this is a fifteen trillion dollar carbon dictatorship. Every aspect of your life will be monitored, and it will be reduced, of course, unless you have money and you are able to trade carbon and purchase carbon. It's a complete transformation of our monetary system, which will be carbon-based. That's right, because he has money. But if you have 20 acres, acreage results in a certain carbon output and you will be taxed on the amount of land that you have. So this is also interrelated with Agenda 21 objectives and it is also a land grab. So we're looking at the value of everything being taken away from us. Uh, land is valuable because we can produce on land it's tangible, and so is livestock and other things. We interviewed Patrick Wood, um, who wrote the book Technocracy Rise, an incredible book, but he really outlined and gave us knowledge about, uh, about the value and where this is going. So again, it's a complete transformation of wealth and our monetary system as we know it, so it's carbon-based. This is a reduction of all of our lives. The plan is to put us in poverty, and uh, essentially have two class classes, a ruling class and a, a class that's in, impoverished. This has to do with population reduction, everything else. And how does this relate to geoengineering? Geoengineering is the catalyst. Without geoengineering, we would not have the climate change that we're looking at, and these programs would not have to be, uh, uh, they would not be sold, essentially. So, unfortunately, it's the problem-reaction-solution. With geoengineering, create the problem of climate change. People are noticing that something's going on. The solution, the reaction is, you know, a lot of good people are out there marching. They're demanding that our legislators do more to address climate change. Did they define more? No, they didn't. 
So essentially what they're saying is we want you to have more power. We want you to dictate. We want you to mandate. We want you to take away our ability to make choices. And again, this is all predicated on climate models that do not source, that are missing the major component of our changing climate, it's geoengineering. So if you don't put that in to the equation, it's faulty, it's false. And that's where we have standing. And I'm convinced we have uh, both sides of the climate change issue. One side is arguing that warming is occurring and it's due to CO2. The other is saying that the planet's cooling. Both sides have uh, peer-reviewed papers, have thousands of, of documents. They're going nowhere in court with this. We have the component that can stop this. And the beautiful thing about it, we have powerful forces, which we feel strongly after this film will partner with us. And uh, unfortunately, you know, uh, I thought that we could do this just with words alone, and words are very powerful, but we also need to be on the same stage as those who hold power in our world. And I think that we can partner to clear up our atmosphere, to clear up our skies, to stop geoengineering, and to pull power back in to our hands, the hands of the people. Any questions? If we use the microphone, <coughs> uh, right now, um, well, you're talking about the clouds being formed uh, in the Pacific Ocean. That's international waters. We have very little jurisdiction of what is going on in international waters. However, in California, there's Prop 165 it, that is controlling what is allowed to be polluted in the water and the air. And it's already been established in court when Lockheed was making the skunk works out in, in Palmdale that, uh, that the government cannot oversee Prop 165. If you were to do your research projects, your flybys in California, mm -hmm. right now you have legal clout. If you go to the Pacific Ocean and you can you, and say that they're doing something naughty and that there's no rules saying that they can't do that. But if you were to do your research here in California, you already have some legal justification to com complain about it. And it also may, might make the, the flight uh, trips a lot easier to, to do in California than out over the ocean. I'm glad that you, you mentioned that. And really, the, the objectives that we have are, ver are very specific. And, and when looking at a lawsuit, there are literally thousands of directions that we could go. We could look at the EPA. We could look at suing certain government agencies for contamination, property loss. We have trees dying all over the place. Um, agriculture, just due to the drought. I mean, the damages are literally in the billions here in California alone. However, we looked at if we take that route, we're going to miss the whole boat because, again, the goals and objectives for the climate change agenda are to legalize geoengineering without our input, without our input of the legislators. So we might have the, we might win one battle, perhaps, if they don't legalize this. But where does that put us tomorrow and what does that mean for the world? And right now we have a worldwide issue, so we have to represent, we have to look at this and look at what's happening uh, geopolitically and the geopolitical implications of not addressing the climate model issues. So in testing positive for geoengineering, wherever it might be off of the Pacific, we then can say that geoengineering is occurring. Where is it in your climate models? Well, it's not in our climate models. Does geoengineering change the temperature of our planet? Well, it does. It can cool regionally and you'll notice like a nice warm days when the planes start coming back and forth. How many beach days have I had that have been wrecked? The planes come, you're like, oh man, you know, it was a nice 70 degree day and then it drops down to 60, you have to go home. That's happened. But then at night, the aerosols trap heat. So we have uh, university studies, even NASA studies, that indicate that the planet warms. So what's geoengineering doing? Well, it, it does. It changes the, the temperature of the planet. Where is it in your climate models? we left that out. You left that out. Motion to, uh, to stop your climate change uh, agenda. Motion to stop the taxes. Motion to stop legalizing geoengineering because your climate models are bogus. Let's go back. Let's look at the climate change issue. But first, stop geoengineering because we can't look at this issue until you stop it. So 
uh, that's the approach, and I'm, I'm absolutely convinced that that's the most effective approach, and it's very pertinent to GM engineering. Does that make sense? Yeah, uh, although you, you mentioned uh, that you have NASA studies showing this is going on. Could you use some of that NASA information to back up your claim? Absolutely. Well, what we have in, in terms of the official story of geoengineering is that these programs are only in the discussion phase. So they're stating that putting aerosols into the sky is an effective way to reduce global warming. And the theory is that by putting aluminum, things that are very toxic to human health, to ecosystems around the world, but the idea is putting a reflective layer of aluminum into our sky, it will reflect sunlight back into space. So they're using the idea that the planet's warming, stating CO2 is warming the planet, that's debatable, completely debatable, but even the fact if the planet's warming or not is even debatable at, at this moment. So they're stating these are just in, in the, uh, the discussion phase. There have been no geoengineering programs. Absolutely false. We found uh, the geoengineering footprint of aluminum, barium, strontium, other metals around the world that have escalated thousands of times the normal percentage points just in the past couple of years. So it is going on. But again, uh, they have not admitted doing this. They've, there's been a flat out denial. So, so if you verify that they have been testing with this special, wonderful sprinkling that's supposed to lower the global <laughs> temperature, and yet the, they're claiming the global temperature is going up, up that's basically saying it, that they're admitting that that special spray is not doing the job. Well, <laughs> certain studies, yeah, I mean, certain studies completely contradict this. So the whole idea of geoengineering, of using what's called stratospheric aerosol geoengineering uh, is, is debatable. So it, it's just, it's a flat out bogus story. But because it's been ongoing, literally, some people argue, full scale deployment we feel has started since the 90s. We've seen an increase in terms of these programs in the trails and the blocking of our sun. And we've seen uh, uh, over a 20% reduction in sunlight in the past uh, 20 years. There's no question that these programs have been ongoing. But again, they're stating, no, what you're seeing in the sky is simply con condensation trails. It's normal, natural condensation trails. And we're set out to uh, prove them wrong. And we will with the aerosol collection project. How <coughs> substantial is the um, evidence of um, um, aluminum, uh, strontium, um, barium uh, been established by other scientists and is there a consensus or a significant body of scientists that is prepared to go on record with this evidence? Uh, there already is. It's, it's been largely uh, non-sponsored scientists. What I learned when I went to Paris, France, uh, a lot of our, our research uh, people say there's a consensus. I'm going to bring this back quickly to the global warming issue. Uh, a consensus of belief in the scientific community that uh, global warming is occurring and that CO2 is the cause. There is no consensus in the scientific community. Uh, there's a large percentage of scientists who are not sponsored who are stating, no, the planet's cooling again. Our <laughs> we don't even argue that. There's no way you can get an accurate temperature reading you know, currently until geoengineering is stopped. We tend to look at the $15, $16 trillion industry, maybe of an incentive to look past that. But it, I was amazed by the way that the funding system, and we spoke with uh, Dr. Marvin Herndon, world-renowned scientist who's helping us out with the aerosol collection project. He's been an advisor on unconventional gray. And we, uh, we look at how the funding sources come in. Um, those who fund are the large, largely are the foundations, the large foundations who are funding the research in both geoengineering but also in the climate change agenda. And they are paying scientists to look for CO2, to source CO2 into models. We've had no funding in terms of looking at geoengineering contaminants and very little funding, if any, to look at, for example, the planet cooling or to look at other sources for our changing climate. Why? There's a reason for that. Follow the money. This is the climate change agenda. It is the catalyst to form global governance because it's a worldwide issue. 
and now we have the United Nations with the IPCC that's calling for global governance. Somebody to collect taxes, who is that that's going to collect the $16 trillion? It's not the US government. Who is this going to come from? I guess it's those guys over in, over in Turkey. It's those guys over in Europe, right? No, it's going to come from all of us. And they're talking about giving countries who don't benefit from this. There are certain smaller, underdeveloped countries who, who are saying, hold on, we haven't had our, uh, our revolution, on, on, uh, our industrial revolution. We're going to get screwed. We're just about to, to ready, ready to boom. Well, they're saying, well, we're, we're going to pay you $200 billion a year. We're going to finance this new green economy, this new green market. Who's that money going to come from? What happened to America? What about happened to the foundation upon which not only America, but countries around the world have been uh, developed and have been, uh, uh, have been uh, set their uh, political foundation upon freedom? Those are going away. That's what this agenda is. So I want to get back to your RAIN test um, and your test. Yes, there is a, uh, I would say, consensus for scientists who have been performing RAIN tests, it's only a handful though. Um, most scientists now who are dependent upon money and jobs, they're gonna go where the foundation money is, that's how they stay at the universities, that's how they keep their jobs, that's how they keep food on the table. So it's the, the uh, scientists who are now retired who have come and started looking at this issue, those who are open to it, who now have come to realize that yeah, we have a major problem of contamination uh, of aluminum, barium, strontium, and then other things now. What was amazing, we covered in both why and uh, what in the world are they spraying, just aluminum, barium, and strontium. And those metals that we're finding around the world that have escalated several thousand percentage points, uh, those we've been finding uh, in rain tests, and again, they match geoengineering programs. What shocked me, some people did uh, larger panel tests, and I didn't bring this to the public because I did not understand it. I didn't uh, make a connection, but we were finding arsenic, we were finding lead, and other things that were increasing as well. And I didn't know where those were coming from, but I thought it was uh, an important question. And sometimes you have to ask those questions. Now, what we're finding is just about the exact, actually the exact fingerprint of coal fly ash that includes the lead and other things that we're breathing. This is very serious. And people have tested um, uh, their, their blood test and many other tests, and they're finding the same footprint of aluminum, barium, strontium, and then other things in both hair follicle and rain tests as well. So uh, it's a major human health concern. Forests around the world are collapsing. I travel around the world, and I've noticed here in California we have a drought. People are saying, wow, the drought, you know, is, is destroying our trees. But here's what's going on. We have this polar vortex. So we have the jet stream that should be coming into California bringing our precipitation weather patterns, it's hitting a ridge of high pressure. When the aerosols are put into our sky through harp, -like te harp and other like technologies, ionospheric heating, they can heat that metal up. And when the jet stream hits it, it diverts because it can't go through it. What they're doing is sending that jet stream into the Arctic. It's bringing precipitation in warm weather. The ice is melting, some of it at least. Is that CO2? No, they're diverting the warm air up into that region. We'll talk about some other ways that they're uh, working on melting the Arctic and why they would do that. But what it's doing is correcting itself down into the Midwest and the East Coast. That's getting all of that Arctic temperature. Any stream will correct itself. So we're getting, I spent a year and a half in the Midwest and I was there last summer and I noticed about 15, 20% of the trees that are dying. In Maui, where we've had just about normal precipitation, about 20% of our rainforest is dying. So we have tree collapse that's going, around, uh, going on all around the world. And the aluminum uh, is the major concern because aluminum is very toxic. It changes the pH of soil, and it will kill most plant life because it will shut down when bioavailable aluminum is introduced. So we have a major, major... Uh, concern in terms of what this is doing to our ecology, what it's doing to human health, 
I want to leave you with hope today. So when we have five minutes, give me that five minutes of hope so that we can really talk about some incredible things and how this br is bringing humanity together and how we can really uh, utilize this to, to get uh, to uh, strengthen our immune systems and other things. Sometimes there's a silver lining, no pun intended, or an aluminum lining in every cloud. Okay, we have that five minutes. Any additional questions? I'll take one or two more questions. I just have we'll one question, which I think is pretty significant. <coughs> Considering the prevalence of lead and <coughs> arsenic in your studies, uh, you know, I know you have in the past been reluctant to embrace an idea that this is part of a genocidal thinning down of the population <coughs> because perhaps it would tend to brand this movement as being that of kooks. But considering how lethargic and blind the American public and the world public is by the owned media, don't you think that uh, we need to become aware that we may very well be subject to a thinning down genocidal approach, not only through chemtrails, but through GMOs, through Fukushima radiation? And we need to wake up and we need to be mobilized by a visceral campaign, uh, which can mobilize scientists on our behalf as well, that we are going to be killed if we do not react to what is going on. I think you bring up a, a very important reaction. I've been always very open on this issue. While I have not uh, put it on my films, depending on the market, you have to know your audience. Uh, I've been very open. These programs are about death, um, and, and they are destroying the lives of people. And if you control the food supply, which controlling the weather alone allows us con to control the food supply, you can then control political systems, populations, everything else. These programs are about death. They're about destruction. Uh, let's make no, uh, let's not misunderstand that at all. And that's why we're doing this, because these programs are about death. And are they about genocide? Yeah, they're definitely related. And there are many, many layers of the onion, and I think that we need to address all of those uh, at the appropriate time. So I'm very open about that. But let's talk about something that I think we all have in common, uh, and that's kind of intimately related to, to death, and that would be life. And uh, today, I don't know, I kind of feel, you know, I woke up and I, I had this real emotional experience that was about 10 days ago in Chicago almost died after it, that's another story. But, uh, you know, I, I, I started weeping, you know, I had all of this energy coming out of me and I was, I was crying for most of the day and I really, you know, I had a realization, I went through a process, this is pretty heavy stuff, and, and um, really had to look at the way that I address this. And, and sometimes we can get filled with anger, sometimes we can get filled with with hate. Sometimes we can get filled with sadness. We're not doing this to die, we're doing this to live. And collectively, we have an incredible opportunity today in the world. And for the first time, we have an issue that impacts every living thing on the planet. And we've had all of these issues to divide us, to help separate us, and <laughs> not only by, by state lines to international political issues, now we have something collectively to unite us. And this, without question, is that issue. And I'm not talking about uniting us where we have a select few rule by the, by the hand of oppression. I'm talking about uh, an issue that we collectively can come together, that we can empower ourselves, that we can move together, and that we can take power back. This is it. And this is the time. And the time is now. So um, I just want to thank everybody for coming in today. And, and uh, this is a different area where we're going in. And a lot of people, I guess, have been some, somewhat a little bit critical about where we're going. You know, they want more information. Uh, uh, information alone is not, it's not going to solve this. And, and I've been very clear with, with where I'm going. Maybe I don't have the most popular message. Maybe I don't have the message that everyone wants to hear, but I do have a message that we need to hear. And I do have the message of what I feel strongly is needed to move forward and stop this. And I plead to you today, whether it's you, you go home today and, and you support our project, you go home and, and you decide what you're gonna do, look at your activism. Look at the work that you do. Look how you, you address this in a different way. 
because there's always some, our activism should be changing. The work that we do should be changing. And if we haven't changed in the past six or seven years, if we're still, you know, taking the same approach and we haven't really had any changes, then I think we have to fundamentally look at what our purpose is in life. And again, I wake up, you know, somebody asked me on a radio show, do you think you, you were successful in, in, in your last films? You know, you woke up a whole bunch of people. Well, you know, the, in the awareness part, yes. But in stopping geoengineering, no, we failed. We failed because I wake up every day and I see more trails. I see our skies covered. And now I, I look at uh, the scientific community talking, we have to legalize these programs. We have to start implementing these programs. No, we failed in, in certain areas. However, looking back, we want to say we recognized where we were wrong and what we had to do and we took the necessary steps. And I plead to you, we all have that opportunity. Each and every one of us has that to investigate whether it's addressing this, GMO foods, whatever it is that you address. I really encourage you to really question what you're doing, how you're doing it, and where we could change today and move forward in a more effective way. Uh, one last comment. Mm -hmm. You have succeeded enormously and one man in raising consciousness about this issue, it is completely different than it was five to ten years ago. You deserve a lot of credit for doing that. And I, and I certainly want to help you any way possible to go to the next step here. We have to get this out to as many people as possible yes. and mobilize the scientific community and let people know that their lives and the lives of their children depend on that. But you have succeeded enormously in doing that, sir. You are one of the true heroes on the planet. Thank you for saying that. And, and respectively, I'd like to say we all have because... <laughs> Without uh, the support of God, honestly, uh, this would not have gotten done. I've seen patterns in my life that, that I can honestly say it wasn't because of my genius plan or my orders because I've tried to move forward with things that have been a complete failure, and I've moved forward with things that, that God has blessed, you know, and, and allowed me to be a part of. So without God, I would not be able to do it, and without us collectively coming together. And what we did, you know, what we did with, with the last film, what we did, not what I did, I put out a product, people passed it along. So I did, yes, a lot of work, but you know, in, in terms of the millions of people that, that pass this on, that are talking about it, you know, the work that I've done collectively uh, pales in comparison. So it, it definitely is a group effort, and we have the ability to make the change that we spoke about today. There's a whole lot more. I could probably speak for like three hours. I want to thank, thank Jen for uh, Jennifer and Otto for uh, for contacting me. I thought I was going to be out of town, and they were very respectful in terms of saying, "Well, we're still going to keep you uh, on on the uh, on the panel in case you're in town." And, and uh, thank God I am. So thank you so much, uh, everyone. Today we have DVDs from my la last film that does help uh, uh, help support the work so that we can eat and uh, continue to have a roof over our head. And then uh, is Brock in the back. He has our shirts. And what I like about these, this is my first film. After running around trying to sell this issue, I said, you know what? I can't run around. I'm going to wear the shirt. <laughs> and people come up and they go, what are they spraying? <laughs> so I have DVDs that I hand out. And I say, well, I'm glad you asked. So it's much easier for our work and our activism. But thank you all for all that you've done. And I uh, certainly <laughs> enjoyed having this dialogue. And I hope that we move forward and, uh, and all get better at what we're doing. Thank you.